Socialism is an insidious force. It is insidious not because it is a political theory, but because of its psychology and because of the psychology of the human mind. And therefore, today, I would deal with the psychology of socialism and communism. And in order to deal with this, I wish to begin by going to the source of socialism. Many people believe that socialism or communism began with Karl Marx. This is not true. Karl Marx was simply the focalization of forces at work within the collective unconscious of the planetary body, of the people themselves, forces at work since the descent of light from the upper chakras to the lower chakras, otherwise known biblically as the fall of man. The problem of this psychology besets us today, and therefore, if we are going to deal with socialism and communism, we must understand the subconscious patterns within us all that make these systems of dependence instead of independence in both government and economics appealing, appealing to some portion of the being of man, that portion not being the Christ man or the real man. A very interesting writer by the name of Igor Shafarovich wrote a book, Socialism in Our Past and Future. And he said the world's first socialist states were the world's first states of any kind. Elsewhere, he says, socialism is one of those basic universal forces that have been in operation over the entire span of human history and that means the span, the span of human history that is known to us, the post-Golden Age eras. Why does he say this? He has the support of leading thinkers of our day. Alexander Solzhenitsyn recommended this work on communism at Harvard during his commencement address of June 8th. Shafarovich himself, a Russian national and dissident like Solzhenitsyn, was able to state this because of the similarities of the aims and objectives of certain ancient civilizations with those of Russia and China today. According to Shafarovich, these similarities have been considered in the following. I quote from his article. Socialism cannot be linked with a specific area, geographical context, or culture. All its features, familiar to us from contemporary experience, are met in various historical, geographical, and cultural conditions. In socialist states, we observe the abolition of private ownership of the means of production. The abolition of private ownership of the means of production, state control of everyday life, and the subordination of the individual to the power of the bureaucracy. End of quote. He cites three examples of socialist states from the past. Mesopotamia in the 22nd and 21st centuries BC. The Old Kingdom of Egypt at approximately the same time and the Incas. Each of these states were characterized by the lack of private property, a large bureaucracy, a centrally directed economy, and a forced labor system which tended to weaken the family structure of the majority of its population. <clears throat> I would like to point out here that socialism is a more primitive form of an economy than capitalism, contrary to the theories of Marx. It ignores the individual's self-worth, it ignores the real self and the I am presence. This is very clear today when one enters underdeveloped nations or sees people who have not developed an individual Christ consciousness. They are not capable of private ownership or the ownership of the means of production in many cases. And therefore, socialism is obviously a stage of evolution that would precede capitalism 
but would not follow it. That is, preceding capitalism if we understand that capitalism cannot exist without the principle of the Christ self. That capitalism as the free enterprise system, as the path of initiation established by Jesus Christ, can only work when it is founded upon the guru chila relationship that is under, understood to be the individual's relationship to the Christ. If socialism follows capitalism and the free enterprise system, it is because of the decay and the decadence of that system, precisely because Christ, the Christ principle as the principle of the economy and the understanding of the abundant life, has been removed, compromised, perverted, misqualified. I present to you then the thesis that in his theory of economic determinism, that Marx is, Marx is counting on socialism following capitalism because he is counting upon the decay and the degeneration of a capitalist society. Capitalism works when you have moral fiber and the cosmic honor flame. And so the fallen ones count on the degeneration spiral and the spiral of death in the West in order for socialism to be victorious. So their plan upon economic determinism, their concept of economic determinism, is based upon the strategies of their determination to destroy the children of God. In other words, we see behind the theory of the five stages of the economics of a society and movement from the first to the fifth stage, we see behind that actually on the drawing boards of the council tables of the false hierarchy, the understanding that they will sow within any system the seeds of its undoing the seeds of antichrist, the seeds of anti-mother, manipulating the flow of supply so as to always engender in the people a dissatisfaction with the environment and with the outcropping of karma within the environment and therefore to push the people further and further and further to the ultimate goal which is socialism. Socialism itself, as we will see, being based upon death and the death instinct itself. It is my conclusion that capitalism cannot survive except in a Christian nation. It cannot survive without the individualist basis of the economy and the individual goal of life to become the Christ. When it becomes a dog-eat-dog -dog end justifying the means exploitation of the people and capitalist enterprises become monopolistic and the state enters into these monopolies, then you have destroyed the fundamental principle of capitalism, i.e. individuality, as well as the fundamental principle of Christianity, which Jesus stated, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The golden rule is the foundation of a golden age economy and of the abundant life. By foundation I mean it is its beginning and its ending. It becomes the reason for being of the individual and the community he forms, patterned after God government. This ethic and this morality must be present. As we, as we have already discussed, certain compromises of Christ's teaching, certain misunderstandings of his doctrine and his dogma prevent the fullness of Christ's Christianity from being the foundation of our life. And therefore, without the fullness of the understanding of his teaching, you have a weak foundation in government and in the economy. And with mass ignorance, 
it is then more easy to destroy the foundations of the system which is intended to be based upon God and his expression in man. I consider that therefore capitalism is being destroyed today in the West and in free nations on a parallel line and at the same rate as religion is being destroyed and that there is no hope for the survival of the free enterprise system until and unless people cease to use the freedom of the free enterprise system to exploit one another and to rebel against the individual karma, the individual karma of their lives. <laughs>